and certainly again it's good to have everybody here we've got several folks uh, visiting this morning good to have all of you uh, some's not been here in a while and it's good to have you and certainly it's a privilege to be here sharing in God's word with you at any time I have the opportunity well we've certainly been blessed with plenty of rain this spring and summer uh, that's for sure I'm not making any complaints because I'd rather it be a little too wet than a lot too dry uh, but for those who have gardens uh, if you're like me I know it's been a challenge to keep those gardens looking good uh, yesterday I was able to get out in in my garden for a couple hours and uh, pull some weeds that needed to be gone a long time ago and as I was going through the rows pulling out those weeds from around the plants I thought to myself you know from the road my garden didn't look that bad actually when you drive by it looks pretty good until you get up close and then the closer you got the weedier it got and it got to the point to where I walked so close to it I couldn't stand it so I had to get in there and start pulling out some weeds and it you know it's always amazed me how that a weed can outgrow corn and beans and you cultivate and fertilize those but the, the weed grow out in the bulk by itself and outgrow it two to three times uh, as I began to pull those weeds I began to think about similarities similarities to sin in our life as I was going through pulling those weeds out you know some of those weeds were pretty good size and they were out in the bulk where I, I guess I missed them with the tiller and they managed to grow and then there were some weeds that were closer to the plants and and there were some of those weeds that were right in the mid, middle of that corn those corn stalks and you had to really take your time and and be intentional about reaching in there and pulling those weeds out as I thought about that I thought you know sin is a lot like this sin in our lives is a lot like these weeds in this garden some of them are real big and real easy for everybody to see right out in the middle some of them not so much are hidden or pulled in closer to the person and some of them is so close that they're entwined inside that person and you never really see it unless you get in there and you you pull those leaves back and you get really close then you can see that sin and we can see that sin in our lives as well the whole time I was out there uh, pulling these weeds and hoeing I thought to myself if I would have spent a little more time preventing these weeds I wouldn't be out here standing on my head for two and a half hours pulling these weeds and it's the same way in our life with sin if we spend some time preventing sin in our lives we can save ourselves a whole lot of effort and pain sometimes in removing those sins from our life so that's what I wanted to talk about this morning uh, because there's no doubt uh, all of us probably have some weeds in our spiritual gardens we need to pull so I titled this morning sermon uprooting temptation because that's really where it all begins is through temptation is where sin begins so to get started if you want to follow along in your Bibles we'll turn over to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 we'll see that Paul writes to the church of Ephesus here and he uh, reminds us that we all started at the same point and sometimes we need to remember that ourselves because uh, we forget that someone that may be in sin or, or struggling with the sin in their life that we were in the same condition Paul says here chapter 2 verse 2 he says wherein in the time past you walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now worketh in the children of disobedience in other words we've all fallen short we all have sinned at one point in our life and that's our beginning and Satan he is the tempter that's his job he is the tempter uh, the prince of the power of the air the scripture tells us he rules these children of disobedience that Paul's writing about here and we have to remember that he is the enemy of God he is the enemy of anything that is good and he is the enemy of the Christian and he is going to do whatever he can do take whatever steps that he has to take to make you and I fail and he is the tempter he hates the truth 
Uh, and there's a good example of this in, back in Genesis 3-4. There's a very familiar story. We know about this, about where he goes into the, is in the garden with Adam and Eve, and, and God has forbidden them to eat from one tree in the garden. But what was it that in 3-4 that we find out that the, the, the serpent, Satan, tempts Eve with? He says in Genesis 3-4, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. So he began to plant doubt in Eve's mind about what God's saying was, is what God meant. And once she was allowed to be tempted, then that's where sin entered in. Then the fall of man came. And it didn't take long for him to start tempting man. It's in his character. We must remember that Satan is full of malice, envy, hate for everything that is good, everything that reflects Christ, everyone that tries to live a Christian life and follow the examples of Christ, Satan hates it. And we can see that reflected in our world today, can't we? Through people that hate good People that don't want to be told that God's word says one thing, though they do another. They don't want to be told that it's wrong. That's an influence from Satan. Because it's not of God. If it's not of God, then it must be of the world. And who rules the world? Satan. And that's what we have to remember about the, the, the tempter. Because he's a subtle, and he's patient, and he waits for an opportunity. Just as Eve uh, Allowing him wait for her, waiting on that one chance to tempt her, that one moment of weakness to cause her to stumble, and then we're bit. We're bit. We're bit with temptation. That is his job. That's his only job, is to cause us to fail. And that's the beginning of growth of sin, is temptation. Now, there's no sin in being tempted. Let me make this clear. Being tempted is not a sin. How we react to the temptation is where the sin is either uprooted or it's allowed to grow. And that's what we have to be in mind. It's like those little tiny weeds. When you first start seeing them come up, they seem harmless enough. You think, well, I'll get them next week. And the next thing you know, next week, they're this tall. Well, that's the way sin enters into our life. It's the same way. Temptation starts and then a little sin starts and we don't think much about it but before we turn around it's taken over. It's grown into something we never intended it to grow into and it's going to take a whole lot more effort to root it out now that it's grown than if we would have taken care of it when it was this big. And that's Satan's job is to make you think that it's not really a big deal. That it's not really an issue that you need to deal with right now. But we have to remember that is his job. It's his job to deceive us. Why, you might ask. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. What's the reason? 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Well, this is why. Peter writes and says this, and this is very familiar. I've used this many times over the past 18 months or so. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because the adversary, the devil... As a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And we have to remember that. Satan is cursed to spend eternity in the bottomless pit of hell. And he wants all of the company he can achieve. And we have to remember that. We have to understand that that is what he's trying to do. He's trying to enlarge the borders of hell. And he wants you. And he wants your kids. And he wants your grandkids. Do you get the point? He's going to do whatever he can do and whatever he has to do to enlarge those borders. That's his reason. Because he walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I mentioned this a few weeks ago. And it's still true today. And it'll be true a year from now and 10 years from now and 10 years from the time that I leave this earth and all of us are gone. It's Satan's only job. It's the reason he's in operation. It's the reason that he was cast out of heaven 
because he thought himself to be more powerful, more important than God himself. And he wants us to accompany him. Now, how does he do that? Temptation. And don't think that he doesn't know what it takes to tempt you. Because he does. He knows what it takes to tempt you. And you can rest assured it's going to be placed in front of you. And it may not be a big billboard kind of thing that you say, oh, well, that's easy to recognize. It'll be subtle. It won't be in your face. It'll be a tap on your shoulder. And it's going to continue over the course of days, weeks, maybe years. And that temptation continues, continues, and continues. And you have to fight. You have to be vigilant and sober, as Peter wrote, because his main job is to consume you with that temptation, trick you into thinking it's no big deal, and then he has you. Because once it gets a toehold, uh, it's hard to get rid of. He'll keep prying. He keeps poking away at it. He keeps poking away and prying at the mind of a Christian to the point that they might even think of indifference to sin. And I think that's one problem we see in our nation today is indifference to sin, indifference to ungodliness from the Christian, I mean. Whenever we tolerate sin, whenever we tolerate things that are obviously against God's word, that's the same as indifference. And God has no indifference towards sin. He hates all sin. He hates all sin. Main goal for, for Satan is he wants us lost eternally. Lost eternally. Never come to a relationship with God. Never come to a relationship with Christ. Always placing doubt. And if you begin to have a little interest in God, he's going to put things in your mind to make sure that that interest is squashed. If you begin to you decide you want to serve in a higher way, a different way, a better way, some other area in your life you want to serve, rest assured something's going to come to mind that you're not qualified, you shouldn't serve, nobody will accept you. Whatever excuse you can, you can make up, you can think of, it's going to be presented to you. Because he doesn't want you serving God. He doesn't want you to be happy in your relationship with the Lord. He doesn't want you to be happy in your relationship with your family. He doesn't want you to be happy in your relationship at your work. Why, Rob? Why is that? Because if he can keep you beat down, and if he can keep you uh, uninterested and indifferent towards sin, then no one else is going to be interested in being a Christian either. And that's what we have to understand, is that it's an attack from Satan upon us to hurt the cause of Christ. And we have to remember that's his reason. And it doesn't have to be, again, like I said, it doesn't have to be something big. Small quantities work just as well. Small quantities work as well. He'll use every tactic in the book, fair and unfair, to make you think, if you're a Christian, that you're not saved. And he'll use every tactic, fair and unfair, if you're not a Christian, to convince you that you have no need or that you're not worthy to be saved. Or that you've done something so bad that you could never be saved. He'll place doubt in your mind to make you think that it's not necessary. And he'll give you a worldview that says, surely a loving God would not send someone to hell. That's a worldview. And that's a lie. A lie from Satan. A lie from the prince of the power of darkness, prince of the air, the children of disobedience. And we have to remember that. Because that's his job. And what's some of the methods that he uses? You know, Jesus was tempted. We're going to look at that in John 13, verse 27. John chapter 13, verse 27. Jesus, being tempted himself, said this. Or, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself here. This is Judas being tempted. And after that sop, Satan entered into him, and then Jesus said unto him, that thou doest do quickly. Of course, we know that Judas was tempted by the money. He, was, he had to pay, but he also uh, had the, the desire for, for Christ to be in charge and be in power, for Israel to be free. And all of those things appealed to him, and he betrayed Christ. So he can work on our mind. And that's the first.
first way that we can relate to these attacks. Like degrees of sin. Somewhere, somehow, somebody put a degree upon sin that God never put on sin. God hates all sin. But we have sin now uh, in our world that's little sins and big sins and great big sins. It's okay suddenly for a Christian to lie. A little white lie don't hurt nobody. Well, it don't matter if I cheat just a little bit to improve my position. Where does it say that in the scriptures that we can act and, and react dishonestly in some way other than Christ had acted and reacted? Or does it say that it's okay to have a little sin just as long as you don't do one of the big sins? It doesn't. But the world would have you to think it does. And the world will support that because that's where they live, in that area of disobedience. Now, am I saying we're perfect and we'll never slip up and never do something like that? Not at all. I'm not saying that. But it's never okay when we do. And that's what we have to remember. Once we do, once we slip up, once we do something that's wrong, we need to repent of it. Ask for forgiveness and learn from that and move forward so that we don't repeat that. The world lives in this pattern, though. It's okay. We're indifferent to sin because that was just a little one. It didn't hurt nobody. It only helped me to gain this. It kept me from getting someone upset or mad at me. You know, what they don't know won't hurt them kind of thing. Well, what we don't understand is there is no degrees of sin, that God hates all sin. But because of the influence of the world, it's okay. Eyes is another thing. The eyes. Matthew 5, 28, Jesus says this. And, and we can relate to this, especially the world that we live in today and, the, and what you see in the music and entertainment industry. Oh, it's a sight, some of the things. that, uh, And the hypocrisy of some of the things that we see. Matthew 5, 28, Jesus says this, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So the eyes, what we look at, what we spend time viewing, can cause us a great deal of trouble. And we have to remember that. Now, you know, a few years ago, uh, 20 years ago, it was, you would hear me bashing a computer. You know, everything in the world is on the Internet, and it still is. But you know what? Those computers have been shrunk down to where now we carry them in our pockets uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We can't be without within arm's reach of our cell phone. And everything that is available on the Internet is available now to you, your children, your nieces, your nephews, your husbands, your wives. Everything is there. And say some of that is not fit to watch. There's a lot of it not fit to watch. And I'm not going to go over and rehash the things that we've, we've talked about in the past. But whenever you glorify a song that is vulgar and vile and you condemn something that is harmless, I'm talking about the, the song of the year, uh, I think it was from one category last year, and Dr. Seuss. When you condemn one and praise another and you say that good is evil and evil is good, there's a problem. But it's because of our indifference as people, it's because of our indifference as a nation that we do this and we allow Satan's methods to increase. You can't look at hardly any kind of advertisement on television that in some form or fashion does not have uh, some type of sexual undertone to its advertisement. Especially during sporting events, those you can see that they're, they're geared differently. Still, yet advertising is geared differently to the audience. And notice how they're still trying to have sex to sell. And it gets worse and worse and worse. Because once you get a toehold, then it's easy to cram in the rest. And it happens both ways. It's just not a male problem. This is a male and a female problem, and we have to be aware of it. You know, there's even websites available 
if you want to have an affair on your spouse. You know, you've heard of these dating sites. And there's nothing wrong with this online dating stuff in, in context with things. But there are sites where you can go just like you're wanting to have a date with somebody and have an affair with somebody. It's there, folks. It is there. No problems there. Nobody knows. It won't, what they don't know won't hurt them. I, it's just a little thing that I keep to myself. It's like that little weed right down there in the middle of that, those two stalks of corn. Can't nobody see it until you get right down real close. And there it is. And allowed to grow, it will steal from the power of that plant. Just like we allow sin in our lives to continue to remain, it will steal from our spiritual growth. So don't forget the mind. Don't forget discouragement. Don't forget doubts. Don't forget when you stumble that Satan's going to be right there to tell you and remind you of how bad you stumbled and how unworthy you are and how, how big of a faker you are and how you're not a Christian because you did that. That's what he's going to do. Remember, that's his job. There's no way that Jesus covered my sin. Well, the Scripture tells us that Jesus covered all sins for all people. And we have to be reminded of that. Mark chapter 13 Verse 30, uh, 13, verse 9. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as testimony to them. Of course, we know that Jesus is talking to the disciples, warning them about persecutions to come, and we talked about this on Wednesday night as well. We're not physically persecuted at this time in this country. But there are Christians around the world that are. Because we don't, here in America, we don't have a lock on Christianity. It's just not an American thing. It's a world thing. And there are brothers and sisters in Christ around this globe that suffer persecution and for fear of death. And some are put to death, but simply because they name Jesus Christ as their Savior. And we need to be aware of that and remember that because it could happen here someday. We don't want to think about that, oh, Rob, you're crazy. That'll never happen. That, that, that'll never happen in the United States of America. Okay, how many things have happened in the last two years that you would have said 10 years ago that will never happen in the United States of America? It could happen. And that's what we have to be aware of. We have to be on guard. We have to be aware that there could be an assault on us some way, whether it be retaliation at our jobs, out in the community, or maybe even someday harassment to coming to, coming to church. It could very well happen. We've read stories, seen it on the news about people, attacks at these other churches. It don't happen very often. I won't say in rural America, but it does happen in rural America. And we have to be aware of that. We have to be prepared for those things. And we are, as a church, as a congregation, I think we're well, well prepared. But what about us spiritually? Could an attack like that cause us to have doubts in our relationship with God? Because if it could, rest assured, Satan will use that as an opportunity to do that. So you may be saying at this point, Rob, what's the good news to this sermon? <laughs> you have thoroughly got me beat down with this. Now where are we going? Well, I've got good news. I've got the good news for everybody in this room. There's a filter for this. There's a, there's a method. Uh, just like pulling out the weeds, I was out there with a hoe and these two hands. And it takes some work, but that's what we have to do as Christians. We have to work on those things. James chapter 4, verse 7. If you want to turn with me there, James chapter 4. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will what? He will flee. He will leave you alone. If you submit yourself to God, if you resist the devil, the devil will flee. He will leave you alone. 
The problem is we don't want to resist the devil sometimes. That human nature, that human ego, in many cases, I kind of like the attention he's giving to me. I kind of like the attention she's giving to me. Though that's causing me to think about things I shouldn't be doing, I kind of like it. So I'm not going to do anything about it. Instead of resisting, instead of saying, nope, this is not going any further. And stopping, instead of praying, Lord, help me to be strengthened, not to allow this temptation to enter deeper in my life and take root to become sin. Satan, get behind me, just like Jesus told him. Get behind me, Satan. I'm a child of God. And he will, if we resist the devil, he will flee. But guess what? Just the opposite of that. Because what is it? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? If we don't resist the devil, guess what we're doing? We're opening the door and inviting him in. Consenting. Come on in. Sit on spell. Would you like some lemonade? And it's that serious, folks. And we have to take it that serious. We have to confess to God and really to ourselves. And we don't like to admit that we've made a mistake. We don't like to admit that we've sinned. We don't like to admit that we fell short. But until we do that, you can't deal with it. So you have to deal with it with yourself first. God done knows about it. He's just waiting on us to come around and to say, all right, I'm sitting here waiting. I've given you all the tools to deal with this so that temptation doesn't turn into sin. What are you going to do next? So we have to deal with it. And we can deal with it. We're equipped. Mark chapter 14, verse 38. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane has the disciples there with him. Tells them to stay there and what? Listen to this scripture. Watch, you and pr watch ye and pray. Lest what? Lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is truly ready or willing, as some of your translations may say, but the flesh is weak. We, inside, we want to be good. We want, I want to do what I'm supposed to do as a Christian. I want to do what is right. But guess what? Sometimes I don't. And you, you, you're the same way. You want to be good. You want to do what's right, but sometimes you fail. What is it that Jesus says links us up that keeps us protected so that temptation doesn't overcome us? Prayer. That's the line of communication between you and God through the Holy Spirit that gives us the strength to help us to overcome temptation so that it does not settle in as sin. Prayer. Well, I'm not just talking about, Lord, I want a new car. Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. I'm talking about true prayer. God, I am weak in this area. I cannot overcome this without your help, without your guidance. Unless you strengthen me to overcome it, it's going to overcome me. Please help me, Lord. That kind of prayer. The kind of prayer where we submit ourselves, we submit our weaknesses to God, and God gives us our strength. Remember that? Come unto me, all ye who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Cast your cares upon me because I care for you. And that's what we have to remember. He can't carry the load until we give him the load. And he's invited us to do just exactly that thing. Pray. Pray your way out of temptation. God will strengthen you. He will hear you and he will not deny you help. I promise you that. If you seek him sincerely, if you confess your sin to him and your weakness in that area, or the temptation, I should say, because we don't want it to ever grow to sin. We want to keep it in the temptation state. If you go to God in prayer, when you're in that temptation state, he is not going to turn his back on you and say, deal with it on your own, kid. He's going to send you help. He's going to strengthen you to do that. 
to overcome it because he does not want us to fail. He does not want us to fall victim to Satan. We have no other refuge. And I don't care how macho of a man you are, how big a dude you think you are, Satan is bigger than you'll ever be. And he's stronger than you'll ever be. And he'll work on you harder than anything that you ever imagined. And he'll lead you down a path that you never dreamed you'd walk down. And he'll have you doing things you never dreamed you'd do. And if it were not for the grace of God, you would have no hope. And we need to remember that. We need to remember that. We need to remember that as Christians, number one. And we need to remember that for those that are listening or here that don't have Christ as their Savior. Satan is going to do whatever he needs to do, whether it's just a little or if it's a lot, to keep you disinterested in a relationship with God. Jesus, in fact, dealt with Satan himself. We remember? And this is how that we can know that there is no sin in temptation. Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. After Jesus' baptism, he went into the wilderness for 40 days. We remember that? And what happened in the wilderness to Jesus during that period of time? He was tempted of the devil, the scriptures tells us. So Jesus himself suffered temptation three times, the Bible records. Maybe more, we don't know. But the three times that the Bible records, we know and Jesus led a sinless life, and he was tempted by Satan and led a sinless life. So we know that there is no sin in being tempted. It's how we react to that temptation. Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. If Satan was able, if he had the power to do whatever he wanted to do, there would be little to no hope for us at all. But thank God Almighty, a loving God, that we can commit ourselves to him and receive protection. Just like Jesus outlines there. Just like Jesus dealt with Satan. Wanting to make bread out of stones, remember? Wanting him to jump off a cliff so the angels would lift him up. And wanting him to worship him, Satan. And he would give him all the kingdoms of the world, the scripture says. Satan can't give what Satan don't own. You realize that? Satan can't give you what Satan don't own. He can make you think he can. He can make you think that he can provide the things to you by the lack of your commitment. Oh, I can't do that and achieve what I want to achieve. I can't be a Christian because i got things that's way too more important right now. Well, that's a trick from Satan because God owns it all. God owns it all. And we're going to conclude here with Paul writing to the church at Rome. Chapter 8, verse 26. And he says this. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You don't think that God don't know you? You don't think that God don't know what you suffer from or what you are encountering or the temptations in your life? When you don't know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit's already interceding for you. And that's what we have to remember, and that's a truth that should give us great comfort. You don't have to have some kind of big eloquent conversation with God. All he wants to know is that you love him and you want to do your best to serve him the way that he wants us to. And that you're, you will admit that I can't do this on my own and be successful. I have to have help from you, God. I have to have help from the Holy Spirit. I have to be strengthened to get through this day, to get through this hour, to get through this minute. And sometimes temptation and even sin is just like that. God, get me through this one day. 
God, get me through this hour so that I can deal with the next thing that's coming. But that's the kind of reliance that God wants us to have upon him. That's what we have to do. We have to give up ourselves and give ourselves over to God and his complete control. God has provided a way for us as Christians to uproot temptation. It's to be diligent and sober in prayer. Stay in his word. Rely upon him and his strength because we're not strong enough to overcome Satan. We are just simply not that strong. Not by ourselves. But when we are led by the Holy Spirit, when we are relying upon the power of God, we are invincible. And we have to remember that and have that confidence as well. Choice is up to us. And I started off talking about weeds in my garden, but it was really kind of a spiritual thing that I was talking about earlier. I don't know anybody here that probably doesn't have a little weed somewhere in their garden that needs to be pulled. You may have some big weeds in your garden that need to be pulled. And I'm not judging you one way or another. I spend every day making sure I've got weeds, make sure the weeds that's in my garden are taken care of. Where are you at today? If you've never entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, then you've got a problem beyond what you realize. You've got a garden that's full of weeds. You've got a lot of work to do. And if you think that you're going to do it on your own and be successful, you're not. The only way to be successful, to get that garden cleaned up right off the bat, is to hear the word and believe the word. And that word is Jesus Christ. Accept him as your savior. Repent of your sins. Be buried with him in baptism, raise that new creation. You've received the forgiveness of sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit who we just talked about. And then once you're raised that new creation, you put off that old man and you're walking that new creation, guess what? Your garden does not have a weed in it from that moment right there. They're going to come though. They're going to start sprouting. But once you come up out of that baptismal, there's not a weed in your garden. And it's up to us to start to keep working to make sure that the weeds don't come. Now, what about us as Christians? What about us that have a relationship for Jesus, with Jesus for 5, 10, 50, 70 years, whatever the case may be? Where's the weeds at? You know, I don't. God knows. You and him know. Get together with God. Get the weeds out of your garden. Uproot those things so that they don't uproot your life. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation, Jesus is Calling. If you have a decision to make, I want to encourage you to come as we sing the first and the fourth verse of this hymn today. Jesus.